Hello, in this video we're going to look at overlaying and displaying and even thresholding uh, the results of voxel-wise statistical modeling in a correct way, both for interpreting the results and presenting them clearly. So I have my directory set up like this, and I'm going to change into AFNI data 6 AFNI. And in this directory, I have data sets. In this case, we're going to focus on this data set for the moment. These are the results of statistical modeling. So if I use 3D info to investigate this file a little bit, let's see, I see a 3D deconvolve command in its history. And this was the way that the model was specified and carried out. I see some things like motion regressors, and I have some stimulus timing files. This particular data set came from uh, block design fMRI. We'll look at this more in the AFNI proc example um, parts of the processing. The two block stimuli, one was called VREL for visual reliable, and the other is called AREL for audio reliable. And we can see here that this data set has seven volumes and the zeroth volume, index zero, is a full FSTAT. It's nice that the AFNI header contains these labels so that we can easily interpret what every volume is and we don't have to guess. We create these labels when we run it through 3 d Convolve. The full FSTAT basically tells us the, the quality of fit at a given location. It's the ratio of the explained model to the um, variance of the residuals. So where this is high means our, our model was well fit. There's also statistical information that comes along with it uh, involving the degrees of freedom that we always need to be able to interpret statistics. In volume one, I have this, VREL COEF. And if I cheat and look ahead at subric two, I see VREL TSTAT. And we'll see that this is pretty common that when I have a stimulus or a, a coefficient, an effect estimate, something that I was modeling for a regressor, I'll have an associated statistic. This statistic also has other information, in this case, the degrees of freedom associated with it. So I have this for my visual reliable task, for my audio reliable task, both the coefficient and statistic, and then a contrast that was specified when I made the model. And this contrast, the syntax here means visual minus audio reliable, this general linear test. And again, there's both a coefficient and a t-stat associated with it. Okay, so let's take a look at how we would view this data. I'm gonna run AFNI. The underlay by default now is the anatomical volume. Okay, so we can leave that as the underlay. And let's go here to overlay and choose this data set, Funk Slim. All right. By default here, my overlay volume, right, there are seven volumes in the data set, and I could look at any one of these. Let's stick with this one that was chosen, in my case by default, the, with index one, the VREL coefficient. At the moment, the threshold here is sent to essentially zero. I'll just make it zero. So let's focus on what we're looking on the, the coefficient. I'm gonna turn down the opacity a little bit so we see the, the brain underneath it. So, what, what are we looking at here? Um, this is the coefficient for the visual reliable stimulus from our model. In this case, it was a block design stimulus. So this is the beta value or the effect estimate. Now when bold, uh, unit, when bold data comes off the scanner, we have our EPI time series, the units are meaningless. We can't really interpret them as a physical quantity uh, related to anything neurological. However, during processing, and we'll talk about this more during the AFNI proc talk, we scale the data so that each time series, each voxel's time series, is scaled by its own baseline, essentially by its mean value. When we do that, then we get a time series whose values we can interpret meaningfully. They are the bold percent signal change locally. Um, you should be careful that different software scale their data in different ways or give you the option or promote the option of scaling in different ways. The way we scale and suggest doing it uh, really makes sense to us. 
and you can read more about it in this article by by Gong Chen, talking about um, is the statistic value all we care about in neuroimaging? This is a rhetorical question. Uh, spoiler alert: the answer is no. And in this paper, he talks about why we want to present the physical coefficients and why we scale the data the way we do. And you can see here, there's a lot of reasons for it. It's a very nice article and I encourage you reading it. There's also a bio archive version, should you want that. But uh, for the moment, what we need to know is that um, when we have our beta coefficients here, because we scaled our time series to be something interpretable and meaningful, our beta coefficients have meaningful units, bold percent signal change. So that means that we can really be very careful when we choose our color range for how we map and present our data here. So what would be good min and max values for bold percent signal change? In a strong task, we might expect about a few percent change up or down. And in more subtle or event design tasks, we might expect even lower, something of even as low as kind of 1% or, or lower. In this case, this is a block design of a pretty strong task, a visual reliable, so a, a strong visual presentation with a, a, a weak audio, and the audio reliable is a strong audio presentation with a weak visual stimulus simultaneously. So in this case, by default, we can see that the ranges of our color bar are plus 8 and minus 8. Uh, this is chosen automatically from the data set because I have an environment variable that says take the 95th percentile of the volume and make that this range. So it's not chosen very uh, very meaningfully, but this is often a useful way to look at the data. I'm going to deselect this and I could leave it even at 1%, but I'm going to make it 3. So now my min and max are plus and minus 3, and this means that wherever the bold percent signal change was 3 or higher, I should see red, uh, minus 3 or more negative should be dark blue, and everything in between is one of these colors with the hot colors being positive and cold colors being negative. If I want to see the value where I clicked in the overlay I see here, where I'm in white matter, the values are very low, plus and minus, uh, just a, a very small fraction of a percent actually. If I come down here in the visual region, I see things more like one and a half percent, two, three, and this makes sense because for this visual reliable stimulus, I would expect a strong response, and this is a reasonable uh, response. It's not too strong in the visual cortex. Something I'll also notice if I scroll up a little bit, here, even in, in audio, I see some pretty reasonable, pretty strong response. Why do I see that? Because it's not just a purely visual task, it's a visual reliable task that has a bit of audio to it as well. So we'll see that in the visual reliable, in this case I would expect some response in the uh, audio cortex because there is an audio component to this stimulus as well. Okay, so this makes sense at least inside the brain that where, where I see the highest coefficients or where I would expect in white matter and other regions, like out here, I see very low co coefficients where I wouldn't expect. If I look outside the brain, I see, wow, actually, this is interesting. There's a lot of very large coefficients and very negative coefficients outside the brain. Hmm. And this is funny also, my overlay has a minimum of minus 56 and even positive 48, so plus and minus 50% bold signal change. Well. Should I be worried? I, I would be worried uh, for the sake of my model if these occurred inside the brain or for my patient if they were, were real. What's, what's happening here? Well, fMRI data is very, very, very noisy. And we have signal even outside the brain. And this noise can produce very large coefficient estimates. Now, does this mean that my model is horrible? No, because this isn't the only part of my model that I care about. The coefficient tells me an important part of my GLM fitting. That's the value I'm finding. But I also need to know the, the plus minus on it or the standard error, or if you want the significance of my result. For example, 
if someone tells you an election poll result and says it's 45% for one candidate and 55% for the other, that's not enough information to know whether you should be happy or sad for your candidate because you need to know is it 45% plus or minus a half percent or 45% plus or minus 50%. That standard error, that plus minus, really matters. And the way this plus minus is often designated in fMRI context is through the statistical information, the significance. But the standard error, the coefficient, and the significance, the, the t-stat, are, are all closely related. So the t-stat value is just the coefficient value divided by the standard error. That's covered more in the single subject modeling talk. But, okay, what we've looked at here is an important piece of information to understand our data. Do the coefficients look large inside the brain where we think they are? Okay, now we need to know, essentially, where do I most believe the data, and let me see those results. Essentially, let me turn off viewing cases where there's either low significance or, as a corollary, high standard error. Um, so now, that's what I, I use this other piece of information for. I don't threshold based on the coefficient. I want a threshold based on the believability or significance, the t-stat information. So that's why I have the threshold as a different data set than the one that I'm looking at. And as I lift the threshold up here, we'll see the data starts to go away. Now the question is, what's a reasonable threshold? As soon as I start thresholding, that's the first thing to have in mind. Well, if everyone remembers their, their basic statistics, the t-stat for a large number of degrees of freedom is similar to something like a z-score. And so we might consider something around 3 is a good place to start for thresholding. Now, oftentimes we talk about the statistic in terms of the significance or p-value, and we can translate between those immediately if we know the degrees of freedom. This is also why it's important when you report your statistical information to report not just your t-stat values or something like that, but also the number of degrees of freedom. Um, here, you can see in this part of the GUI, there's the p-value. And because the AFNI brick uh, for, this, for every uh, t-stat has the information of the degrees of freedom stuck into it, we can automatically translate it to a p-value so I can see what the equivalent p-value is for this t-stat for this particular data set. And actually, if I want to, I can select my threshold based not on just the t-stat, but say uh, on the p-value. So if I go up here to the thresh button and I right click, I can go to set p-value, and I can choose any particular one. A very common choice is 0 0.001 for voxel-wise thresholding. Boom. In this case, if you notice here, the p-value is exactly 0 0.001, and this is the equivalent t-stat for, for that p-value. AFNI calculated it internally. So that's very nice. And if I browse through my data set here, I see all the parts that kind of pass thresholding at this single subject value. Now, I still see garbage outside the brain. I see things in ventricles. Am I worried? Well, again, fMRI data is very noisy, and this is just a single subject's worth of data. Typically, we put together many, many, many subjects' data, and that helps us drive away kind of spurious noise and artifacts. Something else to note about this data set is this was not nonlinearly aligned to a template, and so we have to take the, the alignment between the anatomical and the EPI data set uh, a little bit um, cautiously. So anyways, um, we, we mostly see strong results where we'd expect most of the parts outside the brain have, have gone away. And we're, again, using two pieces of information to present this data here. One is we're saying, what voxels here do I choose to see? I only want to see those that are, quote unquote, significant enough. If that voxel is significant enough, if it has a high statistic value, then I want to see not just the statistic information, I want to see the value of the coefficient from fitting. And if you notice, that provides me uh, nice information of where there's positive and negative coefficients quite easily. 
So I, I have no ambiguity about what is um, a positive and negative coefficient. Some other software would maybe present the data like this, where now they're just saying, well, let me threshold with the statistic and present the statistic information. In this case, I'd probably have to set a higher threshold, something like 10 for the statistic. And so basically I see that the statistics are high here and very low there. If you notice, I don't see a lot of differentiation within the visual cortex here. I also don't have a nice physical unit that I can interpret the statistic with. Usually um, we use the statistic or the p-value for thresholding, but note we don't compare p-values, so I, I wouldn't compare p of 0 0.0004 with 0 0.00045. Uh, we just use that information for thresholding. So. In this case, this is not ideal because I'm hiding inf some information about my modeling, um, the coefficient value, which would tell me a lot about the quality of my fitting. Is it reasonable, either too high or too small? So let me go back to the way that I'd prefer to present it using our meaningful coefficients here as the, the color and leaving the thresholding to the statistical information. Okay, so fine. Something else to note here, just about thresholding in general, I see that things are thresholded, but what do I know about a voxel that's just outside here? Um, is, it, is it really totally inactive out here, so I shouldn't know anything about this information? Or how would I know if there were maybe an artifact here, and that's why I didn't see anything? Um, thresholding can be useful in terms of highlighting certain regions of the brain that we think are, are uh, most interesting to interpret. However, getting rid of these can hide information like, is there an artifact there? Is there something interesting here? Is it just below threshold or is it really far below threshold? Things like that. So in order to be able to both threshold and still see information uh, without the thresholding, there's this button here, this A, that I can click. And A stands for alpha fading. So let me toggle between having it on and off. What this is, is the results that are above threshold are essentially opaque at the level of, of my maximum opacity. And let me turn it up to fully opaque here for the moment. When I turn on this alpha, what I do is I see other results below thresholding, but they are more transparent. So alpha is a, a standard channel that's used to uh, encode opacity. So it's zero for fully transparent things and one for opaque. And basically anything above threshold has an opacity of one. And as the value of the T statistic gets lower and lower below the threshold, the uh, represented color becomes more and more transparent until you really can't see it. Now this is useful to both show data and highlight things that are opaque while still seeing other things. So I could see if there's, for example, an artifact, but it's a little bit hard to see what's exactly above threshold. So this, this B button helps with that. It puts a box around things that are above threshold. So if I turn it off, I can turn the box on and then alpha, and you can see how this works. So we think that this is a pretty nice way to view uh, a lot of intermediate results. And even for presenting results at the group level, this is useful. So this alpha and box are used to highlight certain active regions or the most significant regions that are above thresholding. But now you don't sacrifice information outside of it either. Okay, so that is presenting statistical data. And we'll pause here.